Okay, great. Um, so I'm really excited to be here um, tonight and talk with you a little bit about the project that I'm working on right now, which is the New York State Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, this is a citizen science project that's going on from starting January of this year um, for the next five years, so into the end of 2024. And tonight I would like to talk with you a little bit about the joys of the atlas. I and mean, Doug just mentioned that um, birding and watching for, uh, breeding behaviors is my favorite type of birding. Um, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a little bit of a better feel for why, um, why it's a really great way to get outside and enjoy nature. So I want to start with what is an atlas. Um, so some of you may be familiar with uh, like the National Geographic Atlas, um, which has a collection of maps. Um, an atlas can also be a collection of charts or tables. And basically what they do is take an inventory or catalog a bunch of objects. So you can see the picture I have on the left here, you know, you can take an inventory of books and make some charts and tables and present those in a book. Um, you know, other things that you might take an atlas of besides um, geographic maps. Um, you might be taking a, um, a looking at genealogy, for example, or or even something like um, supplies in a warehouse. Um, but what we're talking about tonight is about birds and trying to inventory all of the birds that are breeding in New York State. So New York is a very big state and it's quite diverse. Uh, so as you all know, we have a lot of uh, common loons breeding, the iconic species of the Adirondacks. Um, but then we also have a lot of other species. So we have piping plovers breeding down on Long Island. We have bobolinks that are breeding in the grasslands in the central part of the state. Alienated woodpeckers, which you'll notice is our logo for the atlas. You can see the logo up in the top right corner of the slide. Um, they're breeding throughout much of upstate New York. Blue jays, everyone's familiar with them. They're pretty ubiquitous. Uh, black terns and other um, uh, wetland birds are breed along the Great Lakes. We've also got some beautiful forest birds and scarlet tanager. Um, a lot of warbler species that breed um, throughout the central um, central part of the state and, and Hudson Valley. And then we also have some you know, birds that are breeding on Lake Champlain with great, great, um, great inheritance. But we have so many different species. We have such a diverse state. And the question really becomes, how would you go about inventorying all of these species across the entire state? So what we do is we break the state down into a smaller grid system. We make all of these, put this grid system down on the state and it makes all of these small blocks. And what that allows us to do is to get, you know, spread our coverage out across the state, you know, define areas to survey, and we get these really fine scale data and it allows us to get equal coverage across different parts of the state. So within each of those blocks, volunteer observers, such as yourselves, um, would go out into that block and they would go bird watching and they would look and see what types of species they find breeding within that block, and what types of behaviors they're seeing to document that, and then they would record all of that information and send it to us. What we get in the end is we have for every single species that breeds in the state, we will end up being able to get a distribution map for each species. Um, so this is a map for osprey. So this is where osprey were documented breeding um, in 2000 to 2005. So we can see they're like all over Long Island, but also all over central, central New York, the Blue Lakes region. And they're also on all those little small lakes up in there. So this is the kind of information we get, and we can compile all of this 
together into a book we call an atlas and we can really get to learn where birds are living in the state. So this is the first joy of atlasing that I find really interesting. I've moved around the, the country and around the globe um, for quite a while now and I'm happy to be settled but you know on my exploits I um, I've always found it really interesting to learn about distributions and migration timings and when things are breeding where and you know, what the different habitat requirements are for each species. Um, and that's something that, you know, if we do this atlas, we have a really good idea of where each species is breeding in our state. So a little bit of history here. Um, this is the third breeding bird atlas that we're doing in the New York State. First one was in the 1980s, and then the second one took place in, from 2000 to 2005. Um, and so you can see that every 20 years, um, New York State undertakes one of these breeding bird atlases. And I can tell you that in the second atlas, um, we documented almost 250 species. And there are also a few hybrids, you know, things like uh, mallard and black duck breeding together. And then we could, because it was the second atlas, we could look and compare the ranges, the you know, distribution maps from different species in the two time periods. And we could see that about a quarter of those species expanded their range and a quarter of them contracted. Um, and then we can also look at the species level and we can see things like some species that are lost from the state and other species that we aim to the state. Um, so in that, that last at between the first and the second atlas, we were able to document six new species um, came into the state and started breeding in New York. And that includes the trumpeter swan, common eider, black vulture, merlin, central crane, which is picture here, and Wilson Sauro. A little bit more about why we do an atlas. So, in addition to getting just this um, atlas book um, that has all of these different distribution maps for all the species, mm -hmm. uh, we can use that information for a lot of different conservation and management purposes. So, one of those uh, ways, one of the ways we can use the data is to manage populations. We can look and see how healthy and robust some of our uh, game birds are doing. We can also use the data to conduct scientific research. So after the second atlas came out, there was a number of scientific papers that were published that compared the data from the first to the second atlas, uh, including looking at changes from climate change. And we were able to document during that time period that um, half of the birds that are breeding in New York State had moved northward about three kilometers um, in that 20 year time period. We can also use the information for regulatory purposes, so to plan development projects. Um, you know, we have a huge growth in the amount of solar and wind projects going on in the state. And we can use this information because of such fine scale data. We can use it to help site those uh, construction projects in appropriate places. It's also a great way to spread and promote nature appreciation among the public. It's a great opportunity for people to get involved and contribute to population in the state. And we can use the data to monitor population changes. I'm sure most of you have probably already heard by now it is about this paper that came out last fall. Is that better? Um, I'm going to keep going in a second. Um, uh, okay. All right. Um, so this paper came out last fall and it looked at a number of different um, uh, uh, monitoring long term data sets 
um, and was able to document that we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And this is a devastating loss um, pretty much across the board, across different habitats um, and across different economic groups. Um, and the only group that is doing well uh, has that experienced an increase was wetlands. And, and that's partly because we're doing such intensive management for wetland species. Um, so this the data that we collect does go into helping us monitor uh, our populations at this large scale, but it also really helps us with looking at changes on the local scale within New York. So because we've already done two atlases in the state, we can compare the ranges between the 1980 and the 2000 atlases. So this is an example of one species, the red-headed woodpecker, which has been drastically declining throughout the Northeast, and we were able to really document that with our atlas, two atlas periods. Um, so on this map, what you can see is the, the green squares are where the population stayed the same. So it was breeding there, in 1980, and it was still breeding there in 2000. And then we can see in the purple squares the new places where it showed up where they weren't previously going to be. And then, um, unfortunately, the orange, which is by far the largest color that you've seen on here, um, is actually where they disappeared, where they were contracted in the state. So we can use this type of information to. Uh, direct conservation projects for this species. Um, but it's not all bad news, right? So some species, as I mentioned, have moved into the state recently, and they're currently expanding their range throughout the state. So Merlin is one of these species that is actually moving in from the north. It's moving down from the north into New York State. A lot of the other species are expanding in the state, but this is one that's doing something really different. And they were not documented really in the state until 1992. That's when the first nest was actually found. Um, and then by the time that the second atlas came along in 2000, uh, this is the map of where they had already moved in across the state. So throughout much of the Adirondacks, but also a few locations in the um, in the Finger Lakes and in parts of Western New York. And now what I'll show you is you know, we started this third breeding bird atlas in January. And so here is a map of locations that we've already found um, this time around. And the darker purple colors and the newer black colors that you see like in Ileana, Ithaca. Those are already confirmed nesting locations. And so we are already documenting a range expansion for this species in the first year of this atlas. You can see they're already down, down in New York City and on Long Island as well. So that leads me to the, the second joy of atlasing. And that is that the information that is collected is extremely valuable for conservation. And I talk with, I work in the DC Central Office, and I work with a lot of other conservation organizations in the state. And the Atlas is one of the most useful sources of data because it is so large scale. And it gives us this really nice snapshot of what things are doing in a short time period. And People rely on the data all the time. It's really used a lot for regulatory purposes as well. Okay, so we talked a little bit about, okay, we break the state down into all these different blocks and we send people out, we go, we go to a block and we make observations. So what type of observations do you make? So in this case, we're really interested in breeding birds. Um, so any type of behavior that documents breeding, breeding attempts, 
um, is what we're looking for. So say you're up um, on the Great Lakes marshes area, um, you might see some black terns next day. So you would, when you go out to a particular block, you would write that down, you'd record that somehow, and you'd say, yes, I had one black term in the occupied nest. But there's also a lot of other behaviors that you might see as well. Um, so here you have in the top left, you have a bottle, which is, has a mouthful of, of worms and other little grubs. And that bubbling now is very clear either for its chicks or the nestlings, um, or for its female mate, which is sitting on the egg still. Other birds like the male thrush are um, a little bit harder to find and harder to confirm with their breeding, um, but we can still say, you know what, they're on territory if they're saying. They are there and they are trying to breed. And so that's still useful information for us. Other species are really obvious and easy to document breeding. Um, so here are the new swan. You can think of basically many of the ducks, any of the waterfowl. It's really easy to see them and get them and document their breeding. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of other species that breed. Um, around our homes or, or near developed areas. So this is a yellow warbler on its nest. And they won't nest right in your backyard, but they'll be along any sort of trail or you know, wet areas or chubby areas. So that's another type of behavior that, that we might run into. And I have to say that this is really the part of Allison that is my favorite part. So I feel like every time I go outside and I look for these breeding behaviors, it gives me this really intimate look into their lives and I feel a much closer connection to them. And, you know, the other day I went out in the backyard and I was kind of reflecting the forest a little bit and I ran across um, a northern cardinal that was sitting in her nest. Um, and then I looked up from her and I saw a pack of titmouse that was flying by with a mouthful of leaves and moss. So getting ready, you know, carrying that nesting material and building this nest. Um, and then I, I turned around and walked a little further down the trail and, and then there's you know, some woodpeckers that are uh, courting each other. So it just gives you this really different perspective and appreciation for what's going on out there in nature. Okay, so now what? So we've, we've gone out to the block, we've made some observations, we've got, you know, observed some reading in the air. And then the last step here is to submit the data um, to us. And the way that we are collecting data is through ever Eager is an online platform, it's free to use. Uh, it's basically like you know, an online repository for all of your bird checklists, all of your sightings, and it's changed your life list. Um, it allows you to see what everyone else is, is observing as well. And so it's a, it's a really powerful tool. And data entry is, is fairly easy. There are a couple of different ways that you can enter data if you prefer to. Um, enter data on the web. You can certainly you know, keep a checklist in the field as you know, in your notebook um, and then come home and enter it in on the computer. And that's the example I have here on the right. And then if you are more um, tech savvy and you are comfortable using your smartphone, you can use the, the mobile app. Um, and that's also for you. And the mobile app is great because you're Submitting data right as you see it, and you're not going to forget anything, and you don't have to sit on the computer when you get home. Um, so, I, I tend to find that a little bit quicker and easier, um, but other people still prefer to be interviewed on the web. So, here's an example of a checklist. And you'll see on the left here, there's you know, a list of common species that you're probably familiar with. That Maybe in your backyards. Um, basically, in the left column, you have the number of individuals that you saw. 
and then we have the species. And then what we get is these little codes. So if we, um, when we go to enter a species, we can add additional information about them, including any of the breeding behavior codes. So on the right, you'll see this is a whole list of different um, breeding behavior that we, that we document. So for any single species, if you see any of these types of behaviors, you know, territorial defense, like courtship, like agitated uh, behavior, you know, like affection displays, or you know, less, whatever it is, um, there's a code for that, and you can add that to your checklist. And then it shows up on the left hand side here, you'll see that um, red circle where the cat bird was carrying food for young. Uh, so it's pretty easy, just the number of individuals, the species, and then the different codes. Um, so sometimes you might want to add an um, additional comment describing what you saw, um, and that's what those little uh, comments and uh, the uh, Okay, so how exactly do you enter the data? Um, there is one little hitch here. And we want to make sure that, that people are aware of the protocol, they're aware of these blocks and the different behaviors. Um, we do require you to do one, one extra little hurdle, um, and that is that you use that Atlas portal. Um, and basically what that is, is eBird has set up different user interfaces for different projects, um, and, and that when they do that, it they also are providing um, tailored um, interfaces to view the data, to see the results, and we'll show you those in just a second. Um, but so if you're going to enter data online on the website, then you go to ethos.org slash atlas and why. Uh, and that happens to also be on our website as well. So you can see on the left hand side here. Um, there's an about tab at the top, you can sign in some news, um, and that is where all of the information for the website is located. Now, if you're using a mobile, the mobile app on your uh, phone or tablet, then there is also a portal setting there. So basically, you just go into your the app settings, and then you'll see a portal section, and it is up there, and you need to select the Green Bird Atlas. So let me show you a little bit about why we're using eBird and, and what it actually means. So once you hit that, you submit that checklist and it goes into the cloud, goes into our portal. This is what some of the kinds of information that you can see. So one of those is you can see the number of hours that people have spent voting um, in different parts of the state. So this is a map, a fairly recent map, I think it's a new goal. Um, showing the number of daytime hours that people have spent across the state. And this is just since January, um, January 1st. So you can see that the, the yellow squares are where they spend five or fewer hours. And then the darkest blue is where people have spent more than 40 hours in those blocks. Um, so obviously, you can, you can see it correlates pretty well with population centers. But there are some blocks that you, know, you can see people are trying to get out and spread out a bit in the Adirondacks and you know, southwestern Catskills and, and other places. Another thing that you can do is you can zoom in on that map and you can see that the data that has been collected for each of those separate blocks. So here is a block for Albany and it covers part of the pine bush. And you can see it summarizes the number of hours, and there's been only 70 hours in that block, the number of um, nighttime hours, so people have spent only one and a half hours at night in that block, and 99 checklists submitted. And uh, there's already been 44 species documented and has been attempting to nest there. So then um, you can go one step further, and you can actually see all of the details for that block. You can see a lot of the information I just showed you with the, the hours and the number of checklists. You can see six different people have submitted data for that block. Um, you get a little, nice little summary of how many um, species have been observed, have been documented 
fossil food data, all over the community. Five species have been confirmed breeding already. Um, and that just is an indication of how strong the, the evidence is and the, the type of documentation for breeding species. Um, and then below that, what you get is the actual species and the, the breeding evidence that you that has been observed, where it's been observed, when it was observed. If you click on those um, dates there, those are links, and that will take you right to the whole checklist that somebody submitted. You can see who observed it, where they went, um, and all the other species that they document. You can also look at the data for by species. So here is a map for Canada goose. Um, and Canada goose is the um, species that has the most breeding data already. Um, this year. Um, I don't remember exactly how many, I think it's close to 200 uh, blocks already have documentation for these. Um, and again, you can see that those dark purple squares are where they've already been confirmed. And I've actually, uh, maybe some of you have already found some goslings as well, um, but there are a few places in the United States that already have goslings. Um, it seems kind of early, but that they've been busy. Kind of mild winter. And then all of that data is, is in the eBird database, right? And eBird is a fairly big project. It's global. There are bird watchers all across the world that submit data. Um, and eBird is run by the Federal Library of Ecology, and we have a number of different statisticians and uh, data analysts and modelers and, and people that are using all of that eBird data to create some really amazing um, scientific outputs. So this is just one type of um, output that they're creating. This shows you the migration uh, movements of American kestrel throughout the year. You can see, you know, this allows you to see where they're overwintering, how far north they go to breed. You can see when they're moving, when they're migrating through. And then the color actually gives you the number of the abundance, the density of individuals. So some really, really amazing, amazing information there. And that brings me to another one, it's the joys of atlasing. I think is that if you're being, you're, you're going to be part of something that's a really big project, you'll be part of not just New York State understand where birds are and what's going on with them, but also contributing to this global database. Okay, so we went over um, this, this three key aspects of participating in the Atlas, and that is that you would use it for this particular block, then you would go out and you would observe the birds and their breeding behaviors. And then you would enter that data in paper. So I want to talk a little bit about some different strategies for, for how um, you would actually go about surveying in the field. Um, so this is a zoomed in picture of one block. I don't know if you're familiar with the Curry Institute um, for Ecosystem Studies, which is down in Hudson and Millbrook, um, but that's that's where this is. You do some orientation, and um, you know, within every single block, so each block is about three by three miles in dimensions, and within every block, there's a diversity of habitats. Um, so you can see I've outlined some of the different habitats here, and when you're going out and surveying, you're, you're going to want to go to all the different habitats and. Um, try to get as comprehensive of a, of a list of species that are bringing in that block as possible. Um, so, so you might go out one morning and you're going to visit the trails at the Prairie Institute, which has a lot of shrubs and maybe some forests and open fields, but there's a lot of that um, you know, shrub interface. So you might do that one day. The next day, maybe you go down to um, the southwest part, and you're going to hit up some of those wetlands and the open water down there. And other days, you might go to forest habitat or fields, or you know, even the residential areas are, are really important. 
for each one of these different places that you visit, you submit a checklist of the birds you saw and the behaviors that you saw. Um, and then all of that gets um, fed into our database. A couple of important things to note. Um, we do um, require that you stay in the ADA block. So if you're you know, driving around on the road, you want to create a new checklist if you're going to remove a block. Um, so there's a, a number of different ways that you can figure out if they're going to go off or not. Um, they are um, in the eBird mobile app. You can actually see the block boundaries. Um, uh, the other way is to you know, print out or, or put on your um, tablet or phone one of the, the PDF maps that you need available. The other thing that we do recommend is that we uh, favor you know, tend towards shorter checklists rather than longer checklists. And one of the reasons for that is that um, it allows us to better correlate what species you're observing with the habitat on the ground. So if you're going to drive you know, this whole blue loop here, you know, there's a lot of forest, there's fields, there's residential areas, and you know, maybe you see a scarlet tanager there, you know, like, well, where did you see a scarlet tanager on that entire loop? So if you can split it up and say, oh, I went on the in the forest this day, and that, you know, then I have a shorter checklist, and, and then I have a scarlet tanager, and that helps us a little bit better to, you know, gain and, and looking at some of those habitat relationships for your species. The other thing here that I found, so I participated in two other Alice's, but I'm not in Connecticut. And um, I find it really amazing that the, when you're atlasing and you're really focused on this block level, it really encourages you to find new places to go birding. Um, and, and I'm always amazed at like these little nooks, these little town parks or something that actually have a lot of birds going living there um, and and that can be really fun and and some people find you know really new new places that they go back to and visit again even after at the atlas is over with so a little bit more thinking about strategy so i did mention that um that within each block we you know, it's a good idea to visit all the different habitats and try to get as comprehensive of a list of species as possible. Um, it's also good to go at different times of the year. Um, there are some species that are breeding you know, in the winter or early spring, others are breeding in May and June. And, and some, you know, like cedar waxwings and goldfinches, they're not breeding until late July or August. Um, so it is a good idea to go at different times of the year. We also would want want people to try to be you know, some most of their birding should be in the daytime, but also a little bit at night if, if people are comfortable with it. Um, and that helps us get not just owls, but also rails and night jars and things like that. Um, and then, then we do have a, a target for it's kind of a combination of the number of species in the block and the number that we can find breeding. Um, we don't have one sharp cutoff for the entire tree of how many species we should have, you know, should be documented in any particular block um, because the state is just so variable. So if you're like in the Adirondacks or on Long Island, 55 species, 50 species in the block can be really good, and that's probably the most you're going to get. The other parts of the state, central or forested parts of New York, um, you're going to get 9,500 species. And then, um, so, so it's very variable across the state, and it depends a lot on the types of habitats and how accessible those habitats are. Um, some, some areas, it's mostly private landholders, and it's really hard to get access, and so you know, it's kind of restricted in, in what you can do. And then of the species that you see, we do want you to try to confirm breeding for at least 50% of those. And that um, allows us to, to go a little bit deeper and to know um, really what's, what's successfully breeding in each block. OK, 
Okay, so here's a little quick update on what we've already achieved so far this year. Um, there's almost a thousand people have already submitted data across the state. Um, 32,500 checklists across the state. 93 species have already been confirmed to nesting. Um, and here's actually the numbers, and I don't know why I forgot this because I updated this just a few hours ago, but in the goose, in over 400 blocks is already nesting. So I think most of those are like the birds either on the nest or they just hatched the babies. Um, starlings and robins in the nest, and then eagles and ospreys, and the eagles have been, have been busy for months now. Um, ospreys just showed up a couple of weeks ago, but they immediately got on the nest. Red-tailed hawks, house sparrows, and crows. Um, and, you know, obviously the list goes on, but I, I put on the, the, the most frequently reported ones. So what all of that amounts to so far um, is that there's no more summer gold ones. And by that, what I'm referring to is a lot of bird watchers kind of complain that bird watching isn't very fun exciting during the summer months. Part of that is because we're so habituated in looking at, uh, you know, going out and looking for those rare species that maybe don't belong or, um, you know, overshot their migration or just you know, something new that's shown up. Um, but as Alice is saying, it really you know, encourages me to focus on what is here with breeding that's normally here and trying to get those species, get, get to know those species better. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, our website has a lot of information on it, and you can get to that by going to ebird.org slash alice That's where you can find information about the atlas, you can see our blog, you can um, enter data, you can read the data and explore it. Um, all of that you can do from that one URL right there. We also have a lot of different materials available. So we have a handbook, we have different charts that will help you learn when different species are breeding. Um, and it's tips and tricks for particular species that are hard to find. Um, and this is just one example. This is the breeding primary chart. And, and this shows you for each species in what months and weeks of the year we're likely to see them breeding in the state. So the, the green in the center is when they're breeding. Um, the blue is not breeding, the, the pink is migration, and then the, the yellow is kind of where they're transitioning between migration and season. There are also a lot of other useful tools. You know, some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm not a very good birder. Um, you don't have to be an excellent birder to participate. You adjust the birds that are in your backyard. You can have a house friend there or feeding under the eaves or robbing in the aperture or something. That's all really useful information for the atlas as well. If you want to go a step further, there's a lot of different resources out there. Um, you know, in addition to guidebooks, there's also different apps. You know, the, the eBird mobile app is integrated with the Merlin app, you can also see the Cornell lab, um, and that allows you to you know, learn about their natural history, um, but also give you sounds that they give, you know, their songs and their calls and other types of noises they make, um, and it will help you ID birds that you've seen. So you can say, oh, I saw a little blue bird, smaller than a robin, you know, singing from a fence, and it will say, oh, that's a little bit um, things like that. So it, it's, a, it's a super powerful tool. Um, there's a bunch of other apps out there that help you identify songs and learn songs or you know, learn your know, um, field mark and stuff like that. And then I do want to emphasize that, as I just mentioned, that you know, this really is a project where I think everyone can and uh, particularly right now, you know, with, with coronavirus going on, a lot of us are, you know, stuck at home and, and can't 
don't really go very far. Um, and balancing might be a really great way to connect with nature and help, um, and help get you into birding if you're not already into birding. There are birds breeding in every residential area in the middle of New York City. Um, there are birds, birds out there that I say you can observe and, and get to know their, their ecology a little bit better. Um, and again, I'll just emphasize that you know, really it's just going to a block, observing those behaviors, and then eventually you can do it and eat it. Um, this the picture on the right here is actually my husband and my niece. Um, one of my nieces, um, she's super excited to go birding with us. Um, but I, I do see bird, um, Allison, and Allison is a really great way, particularly right now, and staying at home. It's a great way to get out and you know, introduce birding to the rest of your family. Um, it's a really great way to, in normal times, it's a great way to, to meet new friends, to go on different birding trips, to go out with some new people. Um, Normally, we understand that we're building a bunch of different at the same events. Um, you know, people will be going on Allison together. Um, so, it, it, I do think that it is a good way to connect people as well you know, at the same time as you're participating in the Allison contributing to conversation. Um, for in terms of learning eBirds, there are a couple of different ways to do that. Um, the easiest way to get started is to watch the free course that is on the Cornell Labs Bird Academy website. And it's just a video and it shows you through, you know, steps you through all the different steps of how to submit a checklist. Um, normally, I'm giving lots of training workshops around this week as well, but um, they're on hold right now. Instead, I've been focusing more on making some web tutorials, which you can find on my website. Um, and, and also normally we have a mentor program, but um, obviously that's on hold. So the steps for um, getting involved, if you are interested, you can visit the website and learn some more information. You can sign up for our newsletter. And I'll be sending another one out here in the next couple of days. We'll do one monthly. Um, you can check out the handbook. You can follow us on social media. Um, and I'll show you that in just a second. So, um, and then really just go Allison, submit data, and, and have fun and, and learn a lot while you're doing it. Um, so I just wanted to summarize you know, the stories of Allison. Um, you know, learn where birds live, you know, contributing to the conservation, um, gaining an intimate look into the lives of birds. Being part of something big, um, exploring new places, having something to do in seven months, meeting new friends, and what all of that adds up to, I think, um, is a, a new way of birding. Um, I think it would give you a greater appreciation for the, the nature of the wildlife around us. So these are our um, and our website, um, the email contact if you want to email me, and then also all of our social media um, handles. So we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We also have a store on Zazzle where you can buy lots of atmosphere and a special mission for the project. And you can check that out. Um, so with that, I will take questions and um, maybe we'll try to. Catch up questions entered in the chat. Um, and if you can't figure that out, then, then you can always um, send me a chat. All right, so Doug asked Is it a problem for me that observation, more observations come from where there are more people? Um, you know, you know, there's a lot more coming in from city areas than there are from, say, the Adirondacks. Um, I would say yes and no. I mean, this is the first year and you know, everyone's staying closer to home, so it kind of makes sense right now. Um, but what uh, we do want to get equal coverage across the state, 
Um, one thing I didn't talk about is that we have priority blocks. So, you know, there's almost eight, uh, almost 6,000 blocks. And um, we've selected a third of those to be priorities. And those priority blocks um, are scattered throughout the state. And, um, and then the goal is to cover all of those blocks at a minimum. And the way that we'll do that is by you know, having some um, block busting events, we call them. And that's where we get together and say, okay, and we're all going to go up to this um, you know, cabin, let's say Paul Smith or something in the economics. And we're all going to go out from there and go out some kind of blocks to try to fill in some of those gaps. So that is one of the ways that we'll, we'll be trying to get more coverage right across the state. Questions or anyone has a um, need a little more motivation to participate or <laughs> yeah, anything else to share? Hi. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Good. Thank you for listening. We're on the phone. Okay, if there's no further questions, then I'll let you guys all get to dinner. Um, and uh, I did make a recording of this, so um, that will be available as well. Um, so just in case anyone had a plan to become available, but it should be available by tomorrow. Julie, am I unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. So I wanted to thank you, and I wanted to just uh, offer to you some data that. Uh, Carl George, a retired professor of biology at Union, collected for 15 years, I think, he made daily bird counts at a small pond near campus. Um, he had students going out sometimes a couple of times a day, so he was not looking at breeding behavior specifically, but I, he's been looking for a home for his data set, and I may offer it to you with his permission. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I think I would I would recommend for sure trying to archive it. You know, if it goes into Uber, then it's archived permanently. Um, it goes into GBIS, which is the Global Biodiversity Database. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be preserved and available for other researchers to use that way. Uh, but I can help help you figure out how to do that. That would be great. All right, are there any other questions? We'll give it 15 seconds. And if not, Julie, you have to imagine another thunderous round of applause and our sincere thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening right. and happy Atlas. Right. Thank you. And let us know when the uh, recording is available to us. Well. All right. Good night, everyone. Stay Bye. safe. Bye. Hey, Doug and Margie, just uh, yes. This is Bob. Um, Doug, I think the problem that you actually experienced with your um, video disappearing was at your end. Um, typically, something where slowness of your computer or your network link, but your audio, which is very efficient, still was fine. Yeah, actually, I'm on my I'm on my phone for audio because I know my computer 
kind of, even though I'm a, on a wired connection, it doesn't work very well. So thank you. I suspect you were correct. Yeah, I just wanted to feed that back. And Margie, I just wanted to follow up. Did I understand you correctly to say that you did not know how to disable your camera? Um, you're still muted, Margie. You have to unmute. Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I, you know, the thing is you have to hover over the bottom of the screen to see those buttons. Yep. And if you're not familiar with WebEx, which there's so many different applications that we're all using now, it's difficult to find all the buttons on everyone. So yeah, if you're not, if you don't know to hover over the bottom. And then once I was looking for the camera for you, I remembered that there were those buttons down there. So we'll know that for next time. Yeah, so you can. <laughs> some people who have not gotten out of their jammies at five thirty in the evening you know, have, have whatever you know, sleep head or sleep hair. Probably want to do that with the camera. So I just had another question for you. Um, it might have been 